evening, folks. It's good to see so many of you come out on a rainy night. Uh, this um, isn't the best of weather, but uh, you know, in the afternoon drive that I took from uh, Greenville uh, uh, up here, I think it's the most beautiful uh, highway drive I've ever taken. The fall color is right at the height, and the overcast giving it a kind of a gray light uh, was just uh, just marvelous. So I'm going to tell my wife that we've uh, got to come out here more often right at this time of year as it's just about perfect. That's the one thing we miss in the nice even climate of the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, the dramatic uh, change of, of seasons. And that's a great uh, gift of God to the, the people of this region. Now I'm going to um, give you a, a talk about uh, what the evolution controversy, the evolution and creation controversy is really about, and this will come in three parts. Um, first, I'm going to tell you what the, the stereotype of the controversy is. This is the definition of the controversy that you would know about from uh, newspaper accounts, what they say on television, textbook accounts, and, and uh, so on. Most people don't realize that there's anything more to the controversy than that stereotype. So then after telling you about that, I'm going to go second into what I see as the much more interesting and important uh, controversy that I'm personally involved in um, and that you don't hear anywhere near as much as I think uh, you should be hearing about, uh, the controversy over uh, whether or not there is a principle of intelligent design in biology. And uh, third, um, I'm going to talk about some of the ways in which the controversy is developing, some of the things that are happening these days, like that exciting uh, controversy that's occurring out in Kansas, or really that's occurring all over the world uh, because of uh, something that didn't seem that dramatic that happened in the state of Kansas that didn't seem like that dramatic a place. Uh, so that's what I'm going uh, uh, to tell you about in uh, this uh, lecture. Now first, the old controversy, the stereotype. I call it the inherit the wind stereotype. Um, I describe that in chapter two of my book, uh, Defeating Darwinism by Opening Minds. I don't know how many of you have seen the play Inherit the Wind or one of the movie versions that's been made of it. There's a wonderful 1960 movie directed by Stanley Kramer starring Spencer Tracy, Frederick March, and Gene Kelly in a dramatic uh, role, non-singing, non-dancing. And then on uh, Showtime uh, television, um, just uh, this past year, uh, George C. Scott uh, did one of his very last uh, dramatic roles before uh, uh, his death uh, with Jack Lemmon and Bo Bridges, and uh, another update of uh, Inherit the Wind that I hear is uh, very good. Um, and originally, originally it was a Broadway play. Now, the, the plot of Inherit the Wind is loosely based on the famous Scopes trial of 1925 that occurred in Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, but it's, as I say, loosely, one really ought to underline and italicize that term loosely because, in fact, it's highly fictional. The real Scopes trial of 1925 was a publicity stunt, uh, only in form a criminal trial. What happened was that uh, as, of, as, as of that time, high school was just coming into the, the standard picture of education for most people. Uh, you know, finishing eighth grade was the normal school leaving age. College was for the well-to-do. And a high school education really made you a cut above average. So high school was just coming to be the norm. And the state of Tennessee passed a high school education bill, including a big science provision. And in order to reassure the public that this science education in high school was not going to be used to attack the faith of the school children. The legislature included a provision that said uh, it, it would be illegal to teach evolution in the schools. Uh, this, this came out as a result of a deal between the political parties and the governor where it was understood by everyone that this provision would never be enforced. It was meant to be a kind of a symbolic measure. However, it got some publicity and the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, then a struggling organization that had really gotten established in World War I, 
uh, and uh, was uh, trying to increase its constituency, decided that this would make a good test case from its viewpoint. And so they advertised in the newspapers for a teacher who was willing to be prosecuted for teaching evolution so that they could have a case. The ad was read by some local boosters in the town of Dayton who thought this was a great idea for bringing business to the town to have a show trial. And so they made a deal where um, uh, the, if the local boosters could find a victim, as it were, a defendant, see, then you could have the trial and the prosecutors were willing to go along with this. So they found a man named Scopes who had been a substitute teacher. He taught physical education and had occasionally uh, guest taught the biology class who wasn't sure whether he'd ever taught evolution or not, but he did use a textbook in which the subject was mentioned. So, so this entirely friendly prosecution uh, proceeded and then it got out of hand when two very famous men uh, came into the case. William Jennings Bryan, a three-time losing Democratic presidential candidate, offered to prosecute. And Clarence Darrow, uh, the Jimmy Cochran of his day, uh, Johnny Cochran, was uh, just um, uh, off of the OJ trial of the day, you might say, the, the Loeb Leopold three thrill killer uh, case in Chicago. Uh, he detested uh, 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 Brian, and he detested uh, Christianity um, and religion, and he uh, volunteered uh, to take the defense. So these two very famous uh, people came in, it became a great drama, and it became the first American media circus trial, with radio actually covering the, the final uh, day of the, the trial live, WGN from Chicago. Uh, so that's what really happened. It was essentially a publicity stunt. Nobody was going to jail. Nobody was going to be punished. It was all a, a friendly show. But in the play, Inherit the Wind, it's entirely different. It's a serious persecution. The, the movie, as I recall, the 1960 movie, opens with a gang of what appear to be Ku Klux Klan style thugs gathered outside a school. You see, where inside the, the, the teacher is teaching from Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, teaching the students that human beings descended from monkeys. So in seeing this, you know, the, the thuggish people who are actually the leading Christian ministers of the town come in, you know, as a sort of posse, arrest them, take them off in handcuffs, um, and uh, throw them in uh, jail. And then uh, it's a morality play, as the movie develops, in which the Good people are the, the scientist, the science educator, the teacher, the defense lawyer, the Clarence Darrow figure, and the bad people are the Christians. And their theology seems to be limited to saying that you will go to hell if you do any thinking. Um, the love interest in the uh, play, in the movie, is that the teacher who's been arrested and is held languishing in jail is in love with the daughter of the worst of these ministers. And so, of course, they try to break up the romance uh, as well as everything else. They're against uh, love and, and, and all. And, and uh, it's uh, been called a Western for liberals. <laughs> now. The inherit the wind stereotype is really something like that. The, the good guys, open-minded, objective fact finders, they're the scientists. Um, and uh, then the bad guys are the Christians, the, the ministers in uh, particular. They are narrow-minded. Um, they, they, in, in the movie, they, the townspeople go around singing, give me that old-time religion, give me that old-time religion, it's good enough for me. That's the only song that they know. Um, and, uh, and so they, they are in every way ignorant and bigoted. Um, and uh, this is the picture that the, the media give you of this uh, uh, conflict uh, uh, even today. Now, the substance of it is supposedly that the creationists are people who get their information from the book of Genesis and who then say, don't bother me with the facts. You see, it's, it's here in the book and that's all that I'm going to have and, and uh, I won't uh, listen to any uh, evidence. Now, here's a description from um, one uh, leading a popular treatment of uh, science uh, you know, for the general reader, but you, I could get this from anywhere. It's just one that I, I pick up. It's the standard portrayal. According to these authors, um, biblical creationists accept on faith the literal Old Testament account of creation. 
Their beliefs include a young earth, less than 10,000 years old, a worldwide flood as the origin of fossils, and the miraculous creation of all living things in essentially their modern forms. Now here comes the meat of the definition. If you are a creationist, the Bible, not nature, dictates what you believe. Creationists subordinate observational evidence to doctrine based on their interpretation of sacred texts, and then they never change that opinion. That's the official story of what a creationist is. So um, if, if you take that as the essential conflict, then you'll say that the, um, the primary issue that this is about is about things like how old is the earth? They say, uh, is it millions of years or only thousands of years? And was there a worldwide flood that laid down the geological column, or was this laid down over a long period of time with the fossils representing different kinds of creatures that lived in different ages? Those would be the, um, the issues. And you might summarize that all by saying, were we created suddenly and abruptly, you know, basically all at once, or over a long period of time by a more nearly gradual process? So it would say those are the issues, and behind all of those issues, again, according to this inherit the wind stereotype, there is the more general question of where do you get your information about these subjects? You say, uh, the Bible, not nature, dictates what you believe. So according to that stereotype, the creationists are getting their information from the uh, a Bible and not from nature, not from the observation of a nature by scientific means, whereas that's what the scientists are, are doing. So this is a difference in what you could call in fancy philosophical language epistemology. You see, where do you get knowledge from? What's your source of knowledge? Is it the Bible or is it the observation of natural phenomena? Um, and um, if, Finally, if you take this as being what the conflict is about, you may well say that it does not necessarily involve any really decisive religious questions. It does involve the question of whether you can interpret the book of Genesis literally, particularly in its chronology. So that might have something to do with the authority of the Bible. But it doesn't reach such a question as whether God is our creator or not on the, the uh, inherit the wind stereotype. Uh, because um, God could be our creator by a long, slow process, or you know, getting rid of the worldwide flood would not mean that God was not our creator. So you'd say, well, there is not any decisive opposition between theistic religion um, and uh, a science on this uh, a model. And indeed, the movie Inherit the Wind ends, the very final scene of it ends with Spencer Tracy, the Clarence Darrow character, the uh, the, and the agnostic, bitter foe of Christianity in real life, but in the movie, he's a nice guy who's friendly to everybody, um, and the real, you know, kind of Christian. And he, he goes up to uh, the judge's uh, uh, desk, and he picks up there Darwin's Origin of Species, which has been an exhibit, and the Bible, and he shows them his shrugs, sort of, and then he puts them together in his briefcase. So you see, the symbolism is that they really go very well together if you don't listen to these bigots. And that's the, the inherit the wind uh, a, a stereotype. Now, um, and, and as I say, you, you see this in every major newspaper media portrayal of something like the current Kansas episode, that that's what they think is uh, going on. Now, um, further to illustrate this uh, inherit the wind stereotype and the, the traditional view of the conflict, um, it seems to the educated people, the professors, the experts in science, and the media pundits, that the creationists are making what we might call a category mistake. They are mistaking a religious position that has to do with morals, the meaning of life, and so on, for a scientific position which has to do with certain basic facts which should be determined uh, by an objective means. And I, I use this example a lot to illustrate this this view of the conflict. In Matthew 13, uh, verses 31 to 32, Jesus tells the parable, the familiar parable of the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, and this is smaller than all the other seeds. But when it's full grown, it's larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. As everyone knows that. Now, the mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds. Oh, is it? You say, well, what if I were to tell you, as I am about to do, 
uh, that scientists have discovered in South America. An orchid seed, not known in Palestine in biblical times, which is smaller than the mustard seed. Now, what would you say? Uh, we imagine here the botanist come and he says, I've got these two seeds, I've got this microscope, let's look, you know, at the, the measuring device here, which is the smaller? Is that the way we should do that? Well, according to the Inherit the Wind stereotype, if you were a creationist, you would say, put that instrument of the devil away. <laughs> I, I will not look into the microscope because I have the authority of Jesus, my interpretation of the sacred text, which says that the mustard seed is smaller. Um, now, um, how many people here would do that? Uh, of course, and nobody, unless you're joking with me. I've never met anybody who would do that. And say that, that we all understand, uh, fundamentalist uh, Christians, uh, Bible believers, agnostics, all across the board, that an issue of that way, you measure the seed. You look into the microscope. And we understand that this does not, if, if it turns out that the orchid seed is smaller, uh, that this does not, uh, unravel the authority of Jesus uh, or destroy the meaning of the text in any way because the text isn't about isn't a botany lesson about seeds you see it's about the kingdom of heaven growing from such a small thing to be such a large thing and everybody understands that you see well well the the inherit the wind stereotype says something like that is what is going on with respect to evolution and creation that instead of getting their facts from objective investigation looking through that microscope and measuring the seeds they're relying on sacred texts because they think wrongly that something important about their faith is at stake if they do that but if they get over that and realize they should look through the microscope then like Spencer Tracy they'll put the Bible and the origin of species together in the briefcase and be ha live happily ever after so that's the inherit the wind stereotype and the traditional view over the, uh, of the issue. So if that's the case, there's no contest over evidence. One side has all the scientific evidence. The creationists are making a category mistake. Uh, furthermore, the issue excites only a relatively narrow, although quite numerous, section of the religious public, the Protestant fundamentalists. It's not an issue that worries you know, Roman Catholics, for example, Eastern Orthodox, or whatever. Um, it's a, uh, it, it excites only a Protestant fundamentalists, and the basic issue is the age of the earth and the age of the cosmos. They had long and gradual, long periods of time or short periods of time. All right, now, I think that's the wrong or inadequate view of the controversy. Uh, that, that something like that may be going on in the minds of some people. Uh, but it is not what I think the controversy is most fundamentally about. It's really quite different from that, um, and uh, uh, I'll try to explain uh, why. The major question that the Darwinian theory of evolution presents at the philosophical or theological level uh, stems from the claim that all of the leading figures of that science make that evolution is without plan or purpose. It is a mindless process which is not pursuing any goal or going in any specific direction. Um, for example, um, the leading, uh, one of the leading founders of the neo-Darwinian uh, synthesis uh, uh, summed this up very well, George Gaylord Simpson, a professor of uh, paleontology, fossil studies at Harvard, uh, said uh, in his book, The Meaning of Evolution, Although many details remain to be worked out, it's already evident that all the objective phenomena of the history of life, all the entire history of life, can be explained by purely naturalistic or materialistic factors. All these events are readily explicable on the basis of differential reproduction in populations, that's what's called natural selection, and the mainly random interplay of the known processes of heredity, genetic variation, mutation. That's all. Therefore, the meaning of evolution is that mankind is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have us in mind a purposeless and natural process that did not have us in mind. It is unguided. Evolution is without plan or purpose. Now, what about God-guided evolution? Well, God-guided evolution is not actually evolution at all, as the scientific community understands that term. 
God-guided evolution is slow creation. I sometimes call it soft core creationism. Why? Well, the reason is that the evolutionary science community defines their science as the business of giving a naturalistic or materialistic explanation for every phenomenon. That is to say, they must be explained in, t in terms of material factors. Um, the, probably the important verse of the Bible here, if you're going to you know, refer to a biblical comparison, would be that the, the Gospel of John begins uh, by saying, in the beginning was the Word. You see, in the beginning was intelligence and purpose. Scientific materialism denies this and says, no, in the beginning were the particles in mindless motion. See, matter in motion and the impersonal laws of nature, impersonal laws of physics and chemistry, that's all there was in the beginning. There was no mind in the beginning because mind does not exist until it evolves mindlessly from non-mind, from the particles and the laws. Nature had to be able to do its own creating, therefore nature had to have what it is necessary to have in order to do that creating. Now as I say, this is a, an assumption, it's often called methodological naturalism, uh, which is ubiquitous in the evolutionary science investigations. It is simply taken for granted. Thus, for example, the uh, a biologist at uh, our sister campus at the University of California, Los Angeles, Richard Dickerson, uh, wrote that science fundamentally is a game. He said, it's a game with one overriding and defining rule. Rule number one. This is a rule that goes ahead of all the others. Dickerson writes, let us see how far and to what extent we can explain the behavior of the physical and material universe in terms of purely physical and material causes without invoking the supernatural. So purely physical and material causes are assumed to be capable of doing it all. And Dickerson actually puts that a little bit weaker than it's applied in the scientific community because they don't say let us see how far, they say let us assume that we can go all the way. Now therefore one does not ask the question in evolutionary science, is it in fact possible that the laws of nature and the particles can do all the creating? I say that, that is not a question which is up for consideration. It is assumed in the definition of evolutionary science. Of course they can. Our job is merely to find the detailed pathways. Our, uh, we already know the big answer. We just have to work out the specific details. And uh, to give a little bit more concrete example of that, um, the standard scenario for the ultimate origin of life on Earth uh, starts with a soup of chemicals, of carbon-based chemicals, um, which supposedly itself evolved by a chemical means, but let's start with the soup uh, uh, for now. Um, and uh, supposedly out of this, either by chance or by chemical law or some combination of the two, a living organism of a very s relatively simple nature emerged, and then that's the, you know, the ancestor of all the living things that exist today, including everybody in this room and that that's how the whole thing started out. Now, can you ask the question, well, is there really a chemical pathway by which such a thing can occur? You know, is this science or is it science fiction? Did such a thing happen? Can you demonstrate that it is possible? Those are improper questions. Those are questions which the rules disallow. Rule number one, say, of, of Professor Dickerson uh, disallows that. It is assumed that you can do so. The question is, what is the most plausible pathway? And indeed, the debates over this subject uh, uh, proceed in the following way. There's one group that used to be in favor when, you know, when I was uh, younger, 30 years ago or so, um, which said it was by chance. A cha by chance, some molecule emerged from the prebiotic soup which was capable of doing the basic things of life, that is, of reproducing and of metabolizing something. You might call it eating, loosely speaking. You see, it can, it can do something, it can eat, and then it can reproduce, and um, that's what makes it living. Um, and that happened by some chance assembly. 
And then um, the, um, they, they would say that the reason why it has been chance, there doesn't seem to be any chemical laws which would, you know, would produce this kind of a thing. It's, it's much too complex. You, you don't get anything like this out of chemical laws. Um, and so it must have been chance. And we admit that it's forbiddingly unlikely that such a thing would happen by chance. But not to worry, because the hero of the story is time. I'm now quoting one of my Harvard professors, George Wald, who was the leading promoter of this view in those days. Um, and he said, the hero of the story is time. There were billions of years available for it to happen, so even the extremely unlikely becomes likely enough, given so much time, and that's how it must have happened. QED. Now, that view has become out of favor, is in part because more has been learned about how uh, forbiddingly complex even a hypothetical, simplest possible living organism would have to be, and it would be much simpler than any that are actually known. Uh, but more than that, because now the official uh, uh, geological story um, is that life goes back 3.8 billion years, or thereabouts, to practically to the very moment at which the Earth became capable of supporting life. See, before that, it's a desert. It's being hit by meteors all the time. The atmosphere is evaporating. It's, it's a mess. Nothing could, could live there. And so life appears really more in a geological instant, um, which is still a long time as we measure it, perhaps, but is nowhere near you know, long enough for the kind of scenario that George Wald proposed. And so now you find that the leading figure in the field, Christian de Duve, a Belgian biochemist, uh, says, well, it must have been chemical law. You see, we knew it was chance because the, the laws couldn't do it, and we know that it's law because chance can't do it. And, and this is the debate, that one proceeds in the debate by disqualifying the other side. And indeed, um, uh, de Duve will show you how fantastically, impossibly uh, unlikely it is that a chance scenario could be the explanation, and that proves to him that there must be law-like chemical pathways, even though we haven't found them yet. So, you see, the position that is not discussed unless I happen to be there, as I sometimes am, or somebody like me, is that neither of these work. You can't do it by law and you can't do it by chance. You have to have a pre-existing intelligence, of one probably greater than human intelligence, but certainly of at least human intelligence, to make the process work, to, you know, to get the living uh, organism. That would, of course, be a mind. In the beginning was the mind. And it would be an unevolved mind, because after all, we're at the beginning of life here, you see. So an unevolved mind is a supernatural mind, and it is ineligible for consideration. Now, um, as I say, this, is, this, this whole way of proceeding is sometimes called methodological naturalism, and it might be relatively harmless if the evolutionary scientists were aware that it's just a methodological assumption that's, that, that is uh, caused by their own wish and determination to explain everything on the basis of material factors. You see, they might have said, we aren't saying this is true, we're just saying it's the way we define our enterprise and it's what we're trying to do. But that isn't the way they think of it. They actually think of the methodological assumption as a fact. You see, so that they know for sure, and all the literature reflects this, that it was either chance or law or some combination. There is no other possibility. And if you raise the other possibility, you will be told that you are, as I was told when I did this with de Duve and other leading figures at one conference, that you are an enemy of science. See, you are an enemy of science because science is defined by rule number one, let us assume that nature is all there is. Nature had to do its own, own creating. Now, my answer, of course, is no, I'm not an enemy of science. You are. Um, you are exactly like those biblical fundamentalists that you are denouncing in the inherit the wind stereotype. You see, their, their fault, according to your uh, characterization of them, is that they are prejudiced in favor of a sacred text, so they're getting their information out of that and they're ignoring the observational evidence. That's really just what you're doing. Your sacred text is naturalism. And you're ignoring the real difficulties, you know, in, in doing what you say you're doing. Your evidence, fairly evaluated, says that you can't do that and you refuse to recognize that. Well, you can see how popular this makes me. Now, <laughs> In fact, if you make the methodological assumption and treat it as inviolate that nature's all there is, it starts with the particles and the laws and that's all there is, then something very much like the Darwinian theory of evolution must be true as a matter of logic. 
You don't need evidence. You see, it's simply the necessary mechanism to do what needs to be done. You have to start with chance because that's what's left when you have taken mind out of the process. Chance and law. But there's something else that you need. And that something else is needed because as even the arch-Darwinist, arch-materialist, and arch-atheist Richard Dawkins uh, concedes, he says, biology is the study of complex things that give the appearance of having been designed. You see, they give the appearance because of their complexity, their adaptive complexity, the number of things they can do. It's sort of like a spaceship, you see. A, a cell, a simple cell is like a miniature chemical factory, which, uh, uh, or, or you might say is as complicated as the city of New York with a billion proteins doing all these things. It needs a, a guiding intelligence. It needs a designer. So something has to supply that necessary designer. And the only plausible idea anybody's ever advanced is that it's the Darwinian mechanism of random mutation and natural selection. Bit by bit, the complexity, the adaptive complexity, arrives by chance, random variations or mutations. The, the favorable ones are preserved by natural selection. And this is what takes that simple replicating molecule that hypothetically emerged from the prebiotic soup all the way to produce by different lines of descent, flowers and trees on one line, you know, and uh, animals on uh, uh, another line, and, and up to and including human beings. Um, and that's the mechanism that does the work of the uh, designer. And since there is no plausible alternative within the materialist system, and remember, mind is disqualified, um, it's the default position that survives until somebody comes up with a better one uh, that meets the materialist or naturalistic criteria. Now, in every generation, there have been loads of scientists who said the Darwinian mechanism can't work, but they never succeeded in coming up with a more plausible alternative, and so the default mechanism uh, stays in uh, place. Now, um, See, that's the, that, that's the way in which the controversy lines up. And so um, uh, I wanted to ask the question, and did, did ask the question, and have been pressing the question, well, suppose, suppose that we now stop for a moment and audit the books. See, Richard Dickerson, that famous molecular biologist, said rule number one is let's see how far we can go in producing a model based on naturalistic assumptions. Well, I say fair. You know, you've done it. You've had, uh, since 1859, going on 150 years now to come up with a model. Let's step back and audit the books on how good your model is. Now, you see, for this purpose, we have to use different methodological assumptions. We can't assume your model is true in order to audit it. You see, we can't assume the assumptions behind your model are true, uh, unless the only question we're saying, is this the most plausible materialist model? And see, and that's an uninteresting question to me. I concede that it is the most plausible materialist model, just about by definition the neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory. But I want to know whether it's true. So you know, in order to do that, we, we, we can't assume a methodological naturalism. We have to say, how successful have you been on an absolute scale? And there I say, I think you flunk. I don't think it's successful at all. Um, now, um, uh, I've already mentioned the field of uh, prebiological chemistry, the ultimate origin of life on Earth which in fact is in such bad shape scientifically that in recent controversies the scientific leadership has thrown it overboard. You know, that is they will say, well, we just don't deal with that issue. Uh, they used to deal with it very much, but now they know that the experimental work is so negative that to bring that in there is, you know, very much weakens their case. So they, they essentially disavow it, while still saying, of course, we know it was chance and law, we just don't have a specific theory. Um, but. Um, what they will stick with is the neo-Darwinian theory for explaining how everything gets on after you get that first living creature. You see, uh, Darwinian natural selection can't take over until that point because it depends on reproduction already being there. It, it, it operates on traits which are passed on to descendants. And so until the reproductive mechanism is in place, natural selection is unavailable and it won't help with the problem up to that point. But um, after that point, you can say, well, natural selection supplies what's necessary. So at this point, I step and say, right, remember, we're auditing the books now. Uh, we're not assuming your, your assumptions. We're asking how good your model is by an absolute standard. So tell us what it is that's the most impressive thing you've ever seen natural selection doing. Say, what, what has it been actually seen to do? Well, we know what the answer to that is because it's given in all of the uh, textbooks. Um, it used to be the peppered moth variations. I'm not going to go into that. That's being quietly withdrawn because it's been discovered the experiment was essentially a sham. 
uh, the moths don't sit on tree trunks, and they had to paste them on tree trunks to get the photos you see in the uh, textbooks. But the, the leading example today is finch beak variation. And now I quote from official National Academy of Sciences pamphlet on this, you know, telling teachers how to teach it, so you know I'm not dealing with a straw man. This is their best example of what natural selection's actually been seen to do. Uh, it's Darwin's finches in the islands of um, the, the Galapagos off the coast of Ecuador. And they say, a research group led by Peter and Rosemary Grant of Princeton University has shown that a single year of drought on the islands can drive evolutionary changes in the finches. Drought diminishes supplies of easily cracked nuts, but permits the survival of plants that produce larger, tougher nuts. Droughts thus favor birds with strong, wide beaks that can break the tougher seeds, producing populations of birds with those traits. The grants have estimated that if droughts occur once every 10 years on the island, a new species of finch might arise in only about 200 years. As I say, that's from our most august scientific organization in the country, the National Academy of Sciences, for, written for teachers telling them how to teach this subject. The droughts do it. You'll get bigger finch beaks and you'll get new kinds of finches. Now, what the grants actually observed was, is not quite accurately reported there. It's, in fact, I think, a deliberately misleading report. Uh, but what they actually observed was this. They go every year, and, and they did, did observe, that when they, they measured the beaks of the finches the year after a severe drought in 1977, that the surviving finches, most of the finches died, you see, in the drought conditions, that the, the survivors, and, um, uh, had beaks which were three to five percent larger on the average than the beaks before the drought. Now see, these are little birds with little beaks, so it's a little difference that you probably couldn't see with the naked eye. It's something you have to have careful measurements to see. Um, and, but now, and no finches beak change size, you understand that. We're talking about how the um, average size changed because the larger beaked birds pr presumably were the ones who survived. Um, and that's it. Now, uh, ten years later, there were some floods. Um, uh, most of the birds died again, and this time getting drowned. It's a tough <laughs> life. Um, and uh, the surviving birds after the floods, with lots of seeds available, um, uh, had beak size back to normal. So the, the paper that the Grants wrote in Nature, the scientific journal, is titled Oscillating Selection in Darwin's Finches. They say it's, it's back and forth. It's not going anywhere. It's not leading in 200 years to something. It's going back and forth. So it's not facing any direction. Moreover, of course, it doesn't involve any increase in genetic information or complexity. You know, it, it's not like we're getting new systems emerging. Uh, it's just this variation in the size of the beak. So, you, you know, it'd be like saying that there's um, evolution uh, if uh, you have um, Americans are, or, or any population of human beings are taller on the average in one century than in another. And so then they're evolving into a whole new kind of being. See, that would be an, an utterly fallacious argument, and it's the same argument that's here. And, and that's the most impressive example. The reason that's in all the textbooks is that the other examples are less impressive. Okay, so, so I say this is not an empirical case at all for such a, an all-powerful creation, a mechanism. Uh, now, um, one finds uh, other examples in the... Uh, a Darwinian uh, methodology of similar kinds of sci unscientific reasoning, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, accepted, although it violates, you know, any normal rigorous scientific practice. I, I can't give too many examples, obviously, in, in one lecture, but one other I think is very important to understand is the way Darwinians handle the fossil evidence. You see, that, they'll say, and you know, one of the things you'll always hear if you begin to debate this, so is, there's this fossil, there's that fossil, there's Archaeopteryx, there's mammal-like reptiles, there's Lucy, the ancestor of humans, who so see we have all these, this solid proof of our system. Now, uh, one thing is that none of these, even assuming they're exactly what they purport to be, illustrates the method. It illustrates the mechanism of random mutation and natural selection. They really can't do that. And in fact, what they tend to illustrate is some kind of mysterious jump from one kind of thing to another. But that isn't the major point I want to make about the fossil evidence. It's that the fossils are selected, and they are selected out of a huge body of evidence because they are among the very few things that can be interpreted in such a way that they support the theory. 
You see, the, the right way to test a theory or a hypothesis is not to assume it's true and then go looking for confirming examples. That's the classic method of pseudoscience, you see. Is it, you can always find them, particularly if, if you have a lot of an interpretive leeway in, in, you know, in, in uh, interpreting what you see, as you do when trying to figure out what a fossil is. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and the Darwinian claim is that the reason they don't have a lot more examples than they do is that the fossil record is very incomplete. You've heard that, you know, undoubtedly. It's, they only have a few fossils out of a great many that once uh, should have existed. However, look at what actually happens with Darwinian fossil interpretation. Um, there, there are many, many more fossils of, of some kinds than of others, and the reason for this is that many kinds of creatures do not regularly get fossilized. Um, birds, for example, land mammals, uh, do not get fossilized because they get eaten by scavengers, you see, or they decay in the elements before they can be fossilized. If you want to be fossilized, you should live in the shallow seas where you get covered over with sediment when you die. I offer that free of charge as advice. <laughs> If, that, if that's your ambition. So that is why marine invertebrates are heavily represented in the fossil record. You have millions and millions of trilobites, you know, for example, whereas you have very few birds uh, in, the, in, in the fossil record. It just stands to reason. It's just what you'd expect. Now, that being the case, you see, scientifically, if the Darwinian theory is true, and now I'm not speaking just of some general principle of evolution that happened mysteriously and we don't know how because that's too vague to be tested. But the specific theory that small-scale random variations were accumulated by natural selection, if that specific theory is true, you would expect to find it confirmed where the fossil record is most plentiful. You see, and, and you might then have trouble where the fossil record is incomplete. But in fact, all of the important confirming examples come from where the fossil record is most incomplete. And if you um, look at the marine invertebrates, what they show is, again, they show variation. If that's evolution, they show evolution. It's variation back and forth, like with the finch beaks. You see, they're about back and forth within the type. What they don't show is the progressive change of one kind of thing into something fundamentally different. This was dramatically illustrated for me when I had one debate with Niles Eldridge, the curator of marine invertebrates at the American Museum of Natural History. Man knows more about trilobites than anybody probably in the world. When we discussed the evidence for you know, Darwinian theory, he wanted to talk about Lucy. He wanted to talk about hominids, you see, because he knew it's not shown by the fossils he really knows about, which are the most uh, numerous, where the examples come from the area where there's the greatest reign for free interpretation, because there isn't the surrounding evidence that would correct you. Uh, against an absolute standard, it isn't convincing at all. It does not appear that there actually is a creation mechanism that can do what Darwinian evolution would have to do, which is to produce marvels of intricate complexity, more, more intricate than a spaceship or a supercomputer, and to do it without any boost from intelligence, you see. Uh, the, we need engineers to write software for computers and to design spaceships. Uh, but by definition, the job has to be done uh, without them. So um, I say that the really interesting question is not this Bible versus science uh, debate. Uh, that may be interesting in a, you know, for, for its own purposes. The, the, to me, the most basic question is, is there really a creation mechanism? Can you do the creating without um, intelligence on the basis simply of law and chance? Well, we don't stop with the, the argument that the evidence is bad, the finch beaks and the fossils, for example. We argue that there are theoretical reasons why you would think it would be impossible to get that kind of creating done without a pre-existing intelligence. And to state that very briefly, the basic reason for that is that the closest analogy we have to a biological cell, the basic unit of biology, your body contains trillions of cells. A bacterium is a single-celled creature. Uh, a cell um, is like a, a miniature chemical factory. It has to do all sorts of intricate processes and send its billion proteins here and there and around and so where to do specific deeds. Um, and it needs a program to run all of this. You see, something has to be telling everything where to go at the right time and what to do. 
and that's the program. We can analogize it to the operating system of a computer. It's much more complex than, say, your Windows 2000. But, you know, think of that as, as uh, the, the model. Um, and we know that that kind of an operating system requires an author. You see, it's a set, what it is is essentially a set of very complicated and intricate instructions written in language. Uh, so you might think of it again, think of it like the, the phone book or the instruction manual for the computer or any book that you like, the Bible, Shakespeare, um, or what have you. It is meaningful text. And what that means is that it carries a meaning and only a specific arrangement of letters or a very small num number of, of, of arra possible arrangements will do the job. It's specified, you see, by the need to do the job. So it's a specified text. It's very complex. It's long. You see, it's got thousands, millions of letters. You could not put that together by chance. It's uh, effectively impossible, and everybody agrees with that. Now, you can't put it together by law either if you think about it, because what you get out of physical or chemical laws is what we call simple repetitive order. It's the same thing over and over again. See, like a crystal. You know, it, the chemical processes, the, in the, the information in the laws of chemistry causes a crystal to form, uh, but it's the same thing over and over again. It doesn't become a text like Shakespeare's Hamlet. It doesn't become a text like Windows 2000. Um, and um, it, you can, if you think of a book that was written by this way, the book might say something like, re, re, uh, uh, repeat the word nothing over and over again until the printer runs out of paper. See, that's simple order, rep simple repetitive order that laws produce, and it produces a very uninteresting book. Uh, and it never gets more interesting. You see, because the same laws that make, it make the order prevent the order from getting to be more complex. So uh, this is the information uh, argument uh, which is developed uh, in uh, books by uh, some of my colleagues that makes us think you really cannot do the job of biological creating without an intelligence. I, I can't go into this further now. I might add that the seminal works on this have been done by my colleagues Michael Behe, a biochemistry professor from Lehigh University. His book, Darwin's Black Box, is out there. My colleague William Dembski has a book that's just hit the stands. It's not there yet because it's just come out called The Intelligent Design. Dembski's a mathematician and a philosopher. But if you wanted to read you know, about all the details on this, we have a couple of things out there you know, besides my own books. There's a double issue of the magazine Touchstone, which has individual articles by Behe, Dembski, and others, as well as myself. And there's a volume called Mere Creation, which also a compendium of articles uh, on this uh, subject that go into it in considerably more depth. Now, but I'll, that, that's the, the second uh, part. Now, uh, finally, what does this all you know, mean in terms of contemporary uh, issues? Well, when you study something, for example, when you read about something like the explosion in Kansas, over the high school guidelines, um, you, can, you can begin to understand why things are so heated, you see, and why um, uh, uh, there is so much panic in the intellectual and media establishment over what happened. Now, this, the State Board of Education in Kansas did not ban the teaching of evolution. It didn't put the Bible in science classes. It didn't do anything of the kind. What it did was it said that we accept the scientific story of evolution as told in the Finchbeak story, for example, as valid. That is how you get variations in finch beaks. However, if you say that an extension of that is how you got birds in the first place, we regard that as speculative and resting not on the evidence but on the philosophical preferences of the scientists. And so we are not going to require the students to learn that as fact. We're not going to have statewide exams that require them to learn it. Uh, teachers can teach it. School districts can teach it, you know, what, whatever. They can provide what they want. But we don't think it, you know, qualifies as the kind of thing everybody ought to know as fact because uh, it's speculative. Now, that has to do with high school curricula in, you know, a state that is, is not one of the dominant states of the country. It's out there. And you might have thought that the scientific establishment uh, could shake that off. I say, These people are probably going to lose at the next election anyway. Um, you know, what does it matter? Uh, the teachers will probably go on teaching uh, much the same. Um, and uh, uh, why, you know, but there was a panic in editorial offices and scientific offices all around the world 
uh, with heavy-handed denunciations and the media and all, I, I go into this at some length in a book I'm uh, writing right now, the editor of Scientific American called on scientists who sit on college admissions committees to deny admission to high school graduates from Kansas in order to punish the board, to show them that, they, that this has consequences. See, now, now, everything about this is written as if the whole controversy is over this Bible versus science issue. See, but the Kansas standards don't say anything about the Bible. Some of the people who passed them may be Bible believers, but what they're saying is related to the evidence and what they see as philosophical assumptions that are, you know, uh, being put in there in place of evidence, and that's what it's all about. And that's, in fact, you see, what's terrifying to our scientific and intellectual leaders. Because what is at stake then in this controversy is what you might call the foundation of all knowledge in our culture. It is assumed in our universities that you get knowledge from science. Outside of science, you only get subjective belief. That's why, for example, you would never find a public university that has a department of theological knowledge or theological science. You might find a department of religious studies, which is a division of anthropology that studies the various mythologies of primitive tribes, including the Christians. And I say that that is from a relativistic and naturalistic viewpoint, uh, because that's knowledge. That's why you can't post the Ten Commandments in a schoolhouse, at least by themselves. Maybe you could have them, you know, with various other things from around the world, the United Nations Charter and the, you know, Iroquois Treaty and the so on. You see, but you couldn't paste them as if they were authoritative because they're not knowledge, they're subjective belief. And similarly, with everything having to do with God. It's not that the theory of evolution makes it impossible to believe in God if you have a strong enough motive to do so, and nothing could do that. It's not that it proves that God does not exist because you can't prove a negative. What it proves, if it's true, is that you don't need God to do the creating. You see, nature can do it perfectly well on its own through the laws and chance, and so God's an option. And you can believe in God if you have a strong enough motive to do so. What you can't do is say that there's any evidence for God. See, that's what's not allowed. It's just your subjective preference. You like to think about evolution as being God's way of thinking. That's sort of like you like anchovies on your pizza, or you don't. It's a subjective preference, but not something which, about which there can be evidence. And that's why, you see, uh, uh, it is so threatening if, if scientists like Behe, mathematicians like Dembski, legal scholars like myself come in and say, actually, there's evidence that you need an intelligence to be involved in the creation. The evidence changes the whole rules. It turns out that that creator, that designing intelligence is real and necessary. And if that is the case, a huge wrong turn has been taken. There's a bridge that's out. <laughs> and this is the uh, a warning. Now, that's an introduction to this uh, a whole uh, a controversy. My objective in speaking about this um, is not uh, to, to convince people that, that I'm right about the intelligent design issue, that you really need an intelligent designer and so on. It takes a lot more time and effort than I can put into this uh, lecture you know, to really carry that with somebody who is much inclined to doubt. What I would like to convince you of, if I can convince you of anything, you see, is something a bit more modest than that, that it's a legitimate issue. My objective has been to legitimate the question of design, to legitimate the critique of the position that, of course, law and chance can do it all because we like to assume that, to, to legitimate the argument that perhaps that's a matter of subjective belief rather than objective fact or knowledge, that that belief, that certain scientists want to explain everything in terms of chance and the laws, and so they believe that they can. You see, but that's subjective preference. That's the anchovies on their pizza. Um, and it doesn't mean that it is objectively verified by the scientific evidence when the evidence is viewed without the naturalistic prejudice. When we ask the question, how good is your model, not is it the most plausible materialistic model that we've got uh, uh, now. And I believe that if we are able to establish legitimacy of that question, we can turn this topic from being a culture war topic which is what it is now, into a topic of genuine intellectual investigation. Now, of course, it's very dangerous because if you haven't thought all, all this out, let me tell you that some of my adversaries have. 
And they understand that once you get this argument going, that Finch Peak uh, oscillation is not going to suffice as evidence that they have this creation mechanism. And once you get into that point, then you have called something into question that is so basic that a whole lot of other things alongside it might come into question down the road. Uh, that's, of course, you have to wait and see if that actually happens. But I think that is what people are afraid of. They are afraid that an open, unbiased investigation will lead to dangerous consequences. And so they say, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Well, there you are. And now I believe we'll hear from the respondent. Uh, his presence, I welcome. I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Gordon Wilson, Chair of the Philosophy Department here at UNC Asheville, and uh, he's been gracious enough to offer a response to Dr. Philip Johnson this evening. Thank you very much. Before I make my formal remarks on evolution, I would like to take a minute to explain how I have arrived here in front of you. About two years ago, a number of my students here at UNCA, Jeremy Phillips, Jim Kirk, Chris Parker, and Brian Landrum, were active in organizing the Veritas Forum. After one of the presentations, these students expressed puzzlement concerning what they perceived to be only a moderate attendance by students. In our conversation, I attempted to explain why some students, even students who considered themselves Christians, would not necessarily agree with all of the views that I had heard at the previous night's presentation at the Veritas Forum. I think that my remarks were helpful because these students proposed that it might be indeed interesting to have some UNCA faculty respond in a formal way at future Veritas Forum programs. Through the efforts of this year's organizing committee, I have been asked to contact faculty at UNCA to respond to tonight's and tomorrow night's program. I am here tonight to make some comments concerning evolution, and my colleague, Professor Lawrence Doerr, will make some comments on bioethics tomorrow. Now, I would like to make something very clear at the very beginning of my remarks. I am neither a preacher nor a minister. I am not trained as a preacher or minister. And as a consequence, I have no intention of converting anyone. If my remarks here tonight cause you, cause you to waver in your faith, this is not my intention. If I do cause this, please ask me to clarify remarks and do consult with your own preacher or minister. I do stand before you as a university teacher and as someone in academia, I am interested in understanding. My function as I see it is to clarify complex issues in order to further understanding. Regardless of whether you are a Christian or not, and regardless of your personal ideas concerning evolution, I hope that my remarks will make intelligible the reasons for your beliefs and that my remarks will help you understand the reasons others may believe differently than you. Tonight's topic is evolution. Evolution from the time, from the days after Darwin, has posed problems for some Christians in three areas. First, it has presented problems for some who have a certain view of the Bible and the creation accounts for God's, uh, the creation accounts in Genesis. Second, it presents problems for some who are committed to the argument for God's existence from design. And third, it presents in the form of social Darwinism problems with a Christian understanding of the gospel message with its emphasis on social justice. Let us turn to each of these. First, one area which has been problematic for some Christians is that evolution conflicts with beliefs based on a certain reading of the book of Genesis. There are, I would propose to you, two different Christian understandings of revelation, faith, and the Bible. The first is propositional, 
and the second is non-propositional. The propositional view maintains that what God reveals to human beings are propositions or statements. For example, there is one God, God is creator of heaven and earth, etc. Since God has no reason to deceive us, the propositions which he reveals are all true. Faith is simply a question of us humans assenting to the true propositions God has given us, and the container which holds these true statements is the Bible. All that one finds written in the Bible, then, is literally true, and we humans are not to question what is written in the Bible. All we can do is mess up what we know to be true. A few years ago, there was a bumper sticker. Yeah, you may have re remember it. God said it, uh, I believe it, that settles it. Because the Bible states that God created all in six days, and evolution maintains that this took place over millions of years, and because on this view the Bible is literally true, evolution must be false. Furthermore, because the Bible states that God created humans from the slime of the earth, and the evolutionary view that humans evolved by a process of natural selection is simply not true. The second view, the non-propositional view of Revelation, maintains that God reveals not propositions or statements, but himself. God reveals himself, and for these Christians, the revelation of God to humans is in the person of Jesus Christ. Faith is not primarily a question of believing statements, but a question of accepting Jesus and having an interpersonal relationship with him. The Bible contains the human reflection on the encounter with the divine. So when Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that women are to be silent in church affairs, one must ask whether this reflects divine will or Paul's limited historical and cultural circumstances. The Bible is considered to be revealed, but because of the human component, the science, history, and geography in it reflect the limited worldview of the human authors. The Bible on this view is not to be read as a science book or a history book or a geography book. Although the preliminary impetus to this non-propositional view can be traced to the Protestant thinker Frederick Schleiermacher, the father of modern theology, members of various denominations now ascribe to this view. One finds it reflected in the Second Vatican Council's decree on Revelation, which states that what is true in the Bible is what is essential to our salvation. To many Christians who ascribe to this view of revelation and who do not regard the Bible as teaching science, evolution is a non-issue and it is not a threat to their religious beliefs. The second issue which has been problematic for some Christians is evolution and the argument from design for God's existence. The argument from design runs something like this. If one examines the world, one discovers order, purpose, design. This design or order cannot be accounted for by natural causes alone. Consequently, there must be a supernatural cause, that is, God, who is the orderer and the designer. The classical formulation of this argument can be found in William Paley's book, Natural Theology, published in 1802. He wrote that if one were walking in a desert and came across a watch, one would not think, oh, this complex piece of machinery came about from the wind and the sand, that is, natural causes. Rather, one would think there must be an intelligent being who designed such a complex mechanism. He argued that one could prove that God existed by using the following analogy. Watch is to watchmaker as the cosmos is to God. Some Christians and theists have found serious difficulties with this argument. And now you may be wondering, what's wrong with arguing from the order one finds in the universe to the existence of an orderer or a designer? Why would any theist object to this argument? Let me briefly sketch four reasons why caution is needed. First, there are some, including Christians and theists, who maintain that the entire enterprise of proving God's existence is misdirected. 
faith they would hold is a matter of God's grace, freely and gratuitously given by God. To suggest that we humans can, by our own efforts, come to believe that God exists smacks of Pelagianism, an early Christian heresy which suffered the intellectual attacks of Augustine and was condemned by numerous African synods and eventually by the Council of Ephesus in 431. Second, there are some, including theists and Christians, who maintain that the Christian faith is not the result of an abstract intellectual or rational deduction, but rather religious faith is a question of the conversion of the human heart or a matter of human will. Some would suggest that it is the, hum that it is the human will that must accept God and the existence of God is not the conclusion of any syllogism which can be placed on a blackboard. Others, like Kierkegaard, echo the words of the early Christian writer Tertullian, who in his De Carne Christi wrote, I believe because it is absurd. Third, in principle, it may be very unwise for the Christian to base his or her belief in God's existence upon any scientific theory. Science is, after all, a human enterprise, and as a human attempts to understand, science may change as new evidence and data are discovered. For example, Thomas Aquinas based one of his arguments for God's existence upon a good principle of physics at his time, namely Aristotle's principle that whatever moves is moved by another. This argument was rejected by some Christians during Thomas's lifetime and shortly thereafter. Of course, Newton subsequently maintained that everything is in motion unless impeded, and the Newtonian idea of motion replaced the Aristotelian notion of motion, which was the very foundation of Thomas's proof. What happens to Thomas's argument once the physics upon which it was based is replaced by Newtonian physics? This is risky business. Fourth, for the sake of completeness, let me just quickly mention a philosophical objection to the design argument. The design argument argues either from the design of the various parts in the universe, for example, the complexity of the human eye, the order of gravitational theory, etc., to the design of the whole, or it claims that the whole universe displays complexity and design and therefore there must be a designer. There are serious philosophical problems with each approach. First, if one argues from the complexity of the parts to the complexity of the whole universe, one commits the fallacy of composition. For example, one cannot argue because each brick in this building is light and can be lifted by me, that the whole building has the same qualities, namely being light and being capable of being lifted by me. Second, if one argues from the order of the whole universe to the existence of an orderer, one's conclusion is based upon a sample of one. There is but one universe. Typically, in basing our belief on experiential observations, we formulate our beliefs based on more than one instant or effect. These four points, namely that the argument from design makes no mention of God's grace, entails a form of the Pelagian heresy, assumes that faith is the result of a rational conclusion, bases its argument upon the human enterprise of science, which may change, and either commits the fallacy of composition or requires one to accept a belief based upon a sample of one, have been grounds for Christians and theists to reject the design argument. Now, those Christians who do not ascribe to this argument are perfectly willing to let science proceed using its method of seeking natural causes. For example, uh, a couple of summers ago, I, I don't have the appropriate example right now. My example was written on, my paper was written on Friday, and I had the example of the TWA Flight 800 going down. And I mentioned that it was very interesting to listen to the investigators speak. They said things like, we will find the cause why this plane came down. Uh, if I could use a different example, if all of a sudden uh, the microphone stopped functioning, 
we would uh, look for, I, I, I hope we would look for, a natural cause. Did the, was the plug kicked out? Um, I know, some might say that it's divine intervention as well. <laughs> okay, but uh, in any case, uh, students who are in chemistry classes do something quite similar. They proceed, they proceed as if there were no God. If a student in a chemistry class runs a series of experiments and gets results like 70, 72, 71, 70, 72, 13, 70, they will be expected to account for the 13 by natural causes, pressure, temperature, etc. And a response of, oh no, professor, you don't understand, at the very moment I did the experiment, God intervened, uh, this would not convince the chemistry teacher. Now, I think we must be cautious here. Just because science must proceed as if there were no God does not mean, as a matter of fact, there is no God. I have had students in my classes who have proceeded as if there were no final exam, but that did not mean that, as a matter of fact, there was none. On the other hand, we must also be careful not to force science into what it is not. If science does make claims about supernatural causes, either asserting or denying supernatural causes, it is no longer science, but metaphysics. If, for example, a natural scientist maintains that all being is material, there is no immaterial being, I would suggest to you that this science, scientist is making a metaphysical claim about the nature of being and is no longer doing science. For those theists and Christians not committed to a literal reading of the Bible and not committed to the design argument, natural science as natural science can proceed, not as natural metaphysics, okay, can proceed and do its task of seeking natural causes for natural events. Evolution as a scientific theory which seeks to explain in terms of natural causes is not a problem. Religion in this view has nothing to fear from science. Today when we look back on Galileo's trial before the good cardinals of the church who refused to look through his telescope, our own reaction is they should have looked. They should not have ignored the results of science. This more constructive and positive attitude towards science is reflected in a recent statement from Pope John Paul II, who described science as, quote, a potentially important resource to theology, and asked, can we not hope that the sciences of today, along with all forms of human knowing, may invigorate and inform those parts of the theological enterprise that bear on the relation of nature, humanity, and God, unquote. One can even point to the Christian thinker Teilhard de Chardin, who constructively uses evolution in developing his theology. And one even sees a secondary studies appearing, like David Livingston's Darwin's Forgotten Defenders, the encounter between evangelical theology and evolutionary thought. The third and last point that I would like to make concerns social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is not so much a biological theory as a sociological theory. It maintains that humans are in a certain social and economic group to the extent which they have survived in the marketplace. If one is wealthy, it is because in this dog-eat-dog -dog world, one has adapted to one's work environment and one has survived. If one is poor, it is because in this competitive world, one has not succeeded. Since survival of the fittest applies to social groups and those in them, it makes little sense, according to this theory, to take from those who have succeeded in the marketplace and help those who have been unable to adapt. There have been two identifiable reactions to social Darwinism by Christians. Some Christians, believing that God will reward his faithful with the riches of the, of the earth, have been very sympathetic to social Darwinism. Wealth, for some, 
is a sign of God's favor and blessings. And those humans who exercise virtues such as hard work, temperance, industry, and perseverance should be encouraged. For these Christians, poverty is a sign of God's disfavor, and it is caused by vices such as drunkenness, sloth, and laziness. The political implications of such beliefs are obvious. No government should be taking from the wealthy and giving these goods to those who are poor. No government should be taking from God's favorites and rewarding sin, so to speak. A second reaction to social Darwinism by Christians is that it is not compatible with the gospel message of Jesus, who preached concern for the down, downtrodden and poor. Luke 6.20 has Jesus saying, How happy are you who are poor, yours is the kingdom of God. And subsequently in verse 24, But alas for you who are rich, you are having your consolation now. How we individually and collectively respond to our brothers and sisters in need seems to be the final test for humans. And one can find a series of papal encyclicals on social justice. Indeed, in, in the document Economic Justice for All, the American Catholic bishops advocate a continued commitment to our national welfare program. I began my remarks by stating that I hope to clarify the three areas which seem problematic for Christians when confronted with evolution. For those who have a literal understanding of the Bible or who ascribe to the design argument, evolution poses a threat. To those not committed to a literal understanding of the Bible or not persuaded by the design argument, the hubbub over evolution is a tempest in a teapot, a non-issue. More challenging for Christians, I believe, is social Darwinism and its political implications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. I appreciate your thoughts and your, your willingness to respond in this way. Uh, you might want to consider offering questions to, primarily to Dr. Johnson since he's our guest. Uh, Dr. Wilson, we have with us always, so to speak. Uh, so we have two mics in the aisles, and while you're thinking about questions and possibly coming forward, let me uh, comment on the book table. We do have uh, a variety of books, four of which by our speaker this evening, Objection Sustained, Darwin on Trial, Reason in the Balance, and Defeating Darwinism. So a number of books by our speaker with quite a bit more information than he was able to convey to us this evening. Also, let me announce that uh, Dr. Johnson will be speaking at our luncheon tomorrow at Owen Conference Center at 12.15. I would suggest getting there early uh, based upon the crowd this evening. And um, uh, just one, uh, one or two other comments. We do this uh, event year after year. This is our fourth year. We're now doing this purely by private contributions. And uh, and you might want to consider, if you'd like to see this event be an ongoing event, if you'd be interested in contributing as a tax deductible, uh, we've incorporated so we can, we can offer a tax deductible, deductible, deductible status to your gifts. And so you can see one of us about that if you're interested in that. And also you'll notice under your seats we have response cards just to sort of see how you received the, the Veritas Forum this uh, year. So if you, if you would like to uh, fill out that response card, you could. Now if you want to make your way to questions uh, for Dr. Johnson this evening. I'll be glad to sign books uh, uh, afterwards at the table, by the way. We have uh, anyone with a question? We here we have a cut back. Yes, you can go over to either microphone. I'll go back and uh, forth. I have a couple people making their way to the fore here. They're going to fight for the first. Uh, <laughs> well, let the, the older man uh, go first. I approve of this. My, a my question air. has to do with what the speaker just said, <clears throat> that you, science is a human endeavor. First of all, is that true that we know it? Secondly, what does that say about divine intervention in the invention process? <clears throat> hmm. Well, I, science is a, an activity carried out by human beings. It's a human activity, you know, uh, enterprise in that sense. I don't know in what other sense it would be meant. Um, I, and in terms of the divine intervention question, um, 
let me say, I, I think that one of the things that misleads people about the whole question is thinking in terms of natural versus supernatural and divine intervention. You know, that's the chemistry uh, experiment with the one out of place uh, figure uh, in it, a uh, kind of thing. Um, I think you get a much better grasp on the issue if you think about intelligent causes and unintelligent causes. You see, uh, uh, for example, if you have these two students, uh, you know, one of the kind of students who doesn't think there's going to be a final exam or whatever, and he turns in a paper, a chemistry paper, that happens to be word for word identical to one that the professor has found in the published literature. Um, we would not be impressed if the student said, well, it was some combination of natural laws and chance that caused this similarity to arise. We would consider that it was a deliberate, intelligent act, you see, of copying. Similarly, if we're investigating a homicide, we would not consider the pathologist who's examining the dead body to be competent if he or she were to say, well, we assume that all deaths are due to natural causes. There is no such thing as homicide. So we'll just have to figure out how this knife ended in the throat, you know, uh, by, by some combination of law and chance. In short, and it's a part of our normal experience that there is law, such a thing as law, like regularities. You know, we know about that. There's such a thing as chance. They both operate. And there's such a thing as what is often called agent causation, you see, or design. And so the question is, does the evidence show that this is the kind of thing that happens to law and chance, or, or do you need intelligence? Um, now, science actually does this all the time when it's politically correct to do so. It's only banned in certain instances. Um, if you look, you know, archaeologists look at cave drawings, and they have to decide, is this really a drawing, a design, or is it a product of natural erosion? You know, like those mountains that, are, you know, look like Sleeping Bear or, you know, uh, Castle Rock or whatever that aren't really designed. You look at Mount Rushmore, you know, and you see the four presidents, now that's designed. And it, you, you would say that if you were a Martian who just arrived and had no other knowledge of the existence of human beings. Similarly, Carl Sagan, arch materialist that he is, or was, spent much of his, he has a different opinion now, spent, uh, <laughs> spent much of his career uh, investigating uh, signals from outer space, you see, and, and those signals that you get by radio telescope. Uh, may, most of them are just noise, that's random. Some of them are law-like, like pulsars admit a regular signal. Uh, but he's looking for something that is a product of intelligence. And, you know, there's a way you can tell it. If you saw the movie Contact, you know, they, they even discuss that. So what we're talking about is uh, applying the same standards for recognizing design in biology that you would in the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or in other normal science. The reason why it's not allowed is that the evidence would show design and they don't want to recognize the existence of the designer. And that brings up the other element. I appreciate uh, Professor Wilson's good advice that you should not rest your you know, you shouldn't bet your eternal soul, I would put it, on a particular scientific theory because science changes. And see, I, I actually strongly agree with that. Um, and I'm very critical of some people within the, the Christian world who, who take a science too far and they find in Big Bang cosmology proof of every detail in the Bible and so on. This is a wrong methodology. But let's give the same advice to the materialists, to the agnostics, to the liberal rationalists. They've invested heavily in the Darwinian theory. That's why they defend it so fiercely you see, is they're not willing to allow science to change because it would threaten their position. So they should take, you know, that advice and uh, then, then we'd get that kind of change. I'll get you next and then I'll go over to the other side, but you two are first up. Um, I, wanted to say, yeah. I wanted to say something about intelligent design that you were speaking about. Um, if there wasn't intelligent design, then I could have as easily been a tulip as a man. Is that true? Well, if the designer, I mean, if God wanted you to be a tulip, no, I no, suppose I mean, God I mean, could there, have made you a tulip, but then it wouldn't be you, would it? No, I mean, if there wasn't you, design... You could have a tulip instead of you. <laughs> no, you misunderstood me. I'm saying if there wasn't design, an intelligent design, say, evolution, oh. Oh. then you could have easily have become a tulip than a man. I mean, you know, the molecules that made you, you know, you know, I'm trying to say the there's no, you could become any kind of life. I mean, there'd be, no, you know, you know, there's oh. no, no direction is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, what, what is created, what, you know, wh whether or not, for this purpose, you could, you could come out to the same result, whether or not you think that the genome evolved by natural selection, as the Darwinists say, or is the product of some kind of a design and creative process. The fact is it has certain characteristics which cause one thing to emerge rather than another. That, the, 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 you know, the DNA that's inherited uh, from a fruit fly never, you know, becomes a, a tulip. Um, and, uh, it, 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 uh, you know, or, or any other change like that. And in fact, the experimental evidence shows that you cannot alter um, the path of development. It is law, it is written in by law in that sense, um, e even by mutating the DNA. You can't alter it fundamentally, which is fatal to Darwinian exceptions. So I, I you know, I, I don't think it's correct it, that the creator could design something different or natural selection, if, if, if it has the power, it could, could, could do something different, but what it actually does is produce genomes that are programmed to do one kind of thing. Okay, thank oh. you. Yeah, I, I hope I got it. Maybe I just didn't understand the question well enough. I did my best. Yes. Hi, Dr. Johnson, first, thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. I've, I've enjoyed the talk. Um, I have a few, I won't ask more than one or two questions, but um, one thing I want to say is about this uh, whole idea that complexity requires a designer. Uh, which seems to be what you put forth. Um, if, if that, in fact, is true, do you hold that that is true, by the way? Uh, I wouldn't put it that simply. It, it, is spe it is complex, specified, aperiodic complexity, you know, meaningful sequences that are complex, specified by the need for the meaning, okay. and not non-repeating, but that's right. what so requires So obviously ice design. crystals and things like that you wouldn't hold in there, but the, but the life itself is, is that yeah, yeah, and so, yeah, that's right. So if you so, apply ordinary intellectual standards, you infer okay, an intelligent cause. So that we're cause. kind of on the same page then. Um, if that much complexity does require a designer, um, then what about the mind of a, of a creator? Wouldn't that mind be mm -hmm. equally as, as complex mm -hmm. as, uh, as would be required, uh, th that you would require the designer to have uh, created? And secondly, um, it, we live at the end of a century. I think we can all agree that science has has really progressed faster in this century than it has probably in all other centuries that have come before us. And uh, the supernatural explanations for things like volcanoes and earthquakes and disease, uh, the motion of celestial bodies and, and even life itself now, um, the, you know, the um, explanations that came before that were supernatural were, were not right. And uh, why do you think now that your supernatural explanations will turn out to be right even when those failed? And, and then further than that, what does intelligent design as a theory really explain? Oh. And I have one particular uh, thing that I could ask that see where... This is the end. I, yeah, and this yeah. one is the last one. I'll let you respond to those, and then I'll have this, this one thing right. about DNA right. genome. Well, what was the, uh, the, oh yeah, the first one is, isn't the mind of the creator still more complex? This is a philosophical argument that defines what we call the reductionist program. That is, you see, science uh, of, a, this, of a reduction of sort aims to explain everything in terms of material causes. And uh, by, by the very nature of it, you can't bring a supernatural mind into that because that would be something that wouldn't be explained in material causes. And it might be something that's very complex. It would seem, you know, it has to be, have enormous co capabilities at any rate from which you could infer a, a complexity. Uh, and so they say, well, that's no explanation at all. Well, um, you, you, can, you can think that way if you want to, but it may be very self-deceptive. Richard Dawkins relies heavily on that argument in The Blind Watchmaker, you know, to su support atheism. And I think that then once you define the whole enterprise that way, you see then you get to the idea, well, natural selection, therefore, has to have all of these capabilities regardless of the evidence. And you've begun imposing a philosophical dogmatism in place of an open-minded investigation of the evidence. Now, I would suggest that the truth is, if we examine the evidence impartially, natural selection has no creative power. You need intelligence in the process to get the creating done. And therefore, when we go back as far as we can, as our investigations can take us, we have to find mind at the beginning, and that's something that we can't explain. Now, everybody's got something they can't explain. The materialists do, too. They can't explain, you know, the origin of matter or the whole system of evolving universes, if that's a, what they're imagining or something. And I say the evidence indicates that there's an unexplained mind at the beginning. So, you know, that's, that's a question based on the evidence. If you just rule it out with a philosophical proposition, then the evidence doesn't matter. Now, as to the success of science, again, I think the way you formulated this takes advantage of that same natural versus supernatural idea. 
Um, and uh, in point of fact, that what science deals with, the most impressive things are the application of intelligence in the form of engineering. That's what makes all this wonderful technology that we have, is the application of intelligence. So to say that the whole system couldn't exist it, um, unless it was the product of mindless material forces seems to me to be very paradoxical indeed. I would argue that the very uh, ability of human beings to do science rests on the fact that their minds are not the products of uh, mindless material processes, their thoughts are not, that rather they are created in the image of the creator of all of reality, and that's what makes science uh, possible. As to the success of science, by the way, there have been as many failures as successes, and in my view, the Darwinian theory of evolution is one of the grossest of the failures.